Welcome back. Today I'll be reporting to you on a meeting that just took place in April of 2017 in Oakland, California called MAPS, M-A-P-S, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. This meeting is held on a uh, fairly regular basis every few years or so and this time uh, I think there have been about 1,000 people in attendance. The entire field seems to be uh, poised for explosive growth. We have talked uh, in prior lectures on ketamine for example and on the return of uh, psychedelic drugs to psychiatry. There is a rethinking, perhaps even a revolution going on in psychiatry where these drugs that have been banned and put on Schedule 1 by the DEA in the 60s and 70s are now um, coming back and are being utilized in research in psychiatry and neuroscience. Now in this country we of course had the war on drugs and it cost us 50 years of progress in studying these compounds because they were just not available. A small country such as Switzerland uh, much more enlightened than we are, has been doing these studies for decades now and I will report to you from the lab of Franz Wollenweider later in this talk who really has been one of the pathfinding people in this field. Uh, Great Britain, uh, Brexit or not, uh, has uh, also started work on uh, the psychedelics a few years ago, especially in the lab of Dr. David Nutt at Imperial College London. One of the key researchers in his group is uh, Carthard Harris, who has done a number of pathfinding studies that we have discussed earlier, both in the context of meditation and in the context of psychedelics. So let's get down to business and do a little report here on two talks that are available on YouTube as well that struck me as uh, very interesting and kind of be the uh, beacon of where things are going in this entire field of medicine. The first talk is by Dr. Boritz Heifetz. He works at Stanford University having trained back east. He is also a resident in anesthesiology. Now what is an anesthesiologist doing in the field of neuroscience and psychiatry? Well I let him explain that to you. But by brief introduction, he called his talk One Dose Years of Effect or Single Shot Therapy in Psychiatry. Now, as you know, psychiatric drugs are slow and often not effective or effective at a very prolonged latency and insufficient rate, with exceptions, namely ketamine, which we have discussed uh, a great deal before, but also now psilocybin, LSD, and N M N D A, MDMA, I'm sorry, um, also known as ecstasy, a drug that has been banned uh, in the war on drugs, of course, and has been accused of causing uh, brain damage in people. Uh, these studies have since uh, been disproven. So that is the stage. He is talking about a change in the attitude in psychiatry, Maybe we got it all wrong. Our expectation of therapy needing to take years at a time or months at a time may be ill-advised. Maybe the normal state of affairs is a single shot which reboots the brain in, into a different state uh, that allows us to ameliorate the symptoms in a very acute way. The second point he's making is this. The drug doesn't stand alone but sets a context for psychotherapy. In other words, the combination of the hitting the reset button in the context of a psychotherapeutic engagement may be the magic that we need. To illustrate that, I want to start with uh, a, a little bit about ketamine. So as you're probably aware, uh, standard psychiatric uh, treatment for major depressive disorder uh, involves SSRIs. And typically the, uh, the idea is you start with, uh, you know, you start giving a dose of SSRI, then you continue giving the SSRI for months. 
years, a whole lifetime. You can't really, uh, once you come off of the SRIs, in many cases, you basically resume whatever those underlying uh, psychiatric symptoms were. Um, in contrast, uh, work from uh, psychiatrists like uh, John Crystal at Yale, uh, this is over the last 15 years has been an increasing uh, acknowledgement that ketamine has this powerful antidepressant effect. And what I wa really want to draw your attention to is that it, this, the single uh, doseness of it, so to speak, is that so that here is a, this, this is a, a figure from one of their studies where this is basically a, a depression severity scale uh, on the y-axis. And what you see here is a single ketamine infusion and then followed out to a week. And it's compared to basically an active placebo, which is midazolam, a benzodiazepine. And what you can see here is that out even at day seven, you still have an antidepressant effect, even though your blood level of ketamine is zero. So that is very different from SSRIs or basically any other therapy we use in, in modern psychiatry. So this gives us a sense that, well, it may be possible somehow to catalyze a long lasting change. And it turns out that ketamine is not the only such drug. And this is, again, just to summarize, um, you know, what is it we're looking for? A single dose, rapid onset with a durable effect. So then, the idea that Dr. Heifetz is proposing is that we need to go beyond receptors, whether they be serotonin receptors, dopamine receptors, or NMDA receptors, or AMPA receptors. We need to go towards neuronal circuits and the change, the synaptic plasticity induced in these circuits that is really critical. In addition, the drugs we have been looking at so far may be only a subset of drugs that potentially can do these one-stop shopping, uh, one-single-shot alterations in synaptic plasticity and neuronal circuits. Uh, this is a study from Peter Nagle looking at nitrous oxide given in major depressive disorder and looking out at 24 hours and seeing a difference in their, uh, their, basically their depression score. So again, indicative of something where at a blood level of zero, you still have a therapeutic effect. And this is a similar study where they're actually comparing, and these two, uh, the blue and the black, they're comparing isoflurane to uh, electro, electroshock convulsive therapy. And showing that you actually seem to get even, uh, that, that with uh, isoflurane, you get a sustained remission um, over a relatively short time period, but you still get a sustained remission of these depressive symptoms. So again, this is, these, are, these are indications that there are many drugs out there that we haven't really thought about that may have this kind of effect. And now the one that has, I think, the most, uh, the most promise among these and some of the best clinical evidence is MDMA, and this is uh, largely you know, due to the work of MAPS and Michael Mithoffer. Um, these are two studies, you've probably seen these figures before, but the things I really want to draw attention to is that the, the idea that a single MDMA dose, now in their studies they used in some cases two doses, but the point is the same. You have a single dose, at which point you have a, a, a clinical intervention, and then you have this incredibly long-lasting effect. So in the first study, uh, was followed out to uh, two months. And the follow-up study in 2013 showed at, the, again, this is a severity of PTSD symptom scale, that you have an incredible, uh, incredible reduction in symptoms that last up to four years out of treatment. So again, there are people, uh, you know, when I present uh, this work uh, from Dr. Mithofer, people have said, well, this, you know, these are small studies. And what I say to them is that there is even a small study, there's nothing paralleling this in the psychiatric literature. You simply don't see effects of this size, even in small studies, for other interventions. And this is, of course, building on years of anecdotal work and uh, work that had been done before MDMA was uh, scheduled. So you have seen that there are other drugs out there, including... MDMA, more recently, of course, psilocybin, as well as LSD. So the new paradigm then may be combination of a psychedelic drug such as psilocybin or LSD or MDMA 
with psychotherapy. Recently, the FDA has given approval for a controlled experiment, a controlled trial of the combination of MDMA and psychotherapy in the treatment of treatment-resistant post-traumatic stress disorder. And there are some striking anecdotal reports where a single exposure to MDMA has led to 3.8 years of sustained uh, improved, improved, uh, improvement in a particular patient. Uh, now, these are anecdotal uh, experience, of course, and they need to be confirmed by extensive studies. So I'll let Dr. Heifetz now conclude his talk in the next video segment. Uh, your therapeutic effect. The second point is, you know, how can we benefit from that? Well, if you know when it happens, then we can start studying mechanism in the kinds of models that are really prevalent in modern neuroscience. And this is, a, this is basically a truism in modern neuroscience that if you have a change in behavior that's long lasting, there have to be associated changes at the level of synapses and circuits. So a single stimulus with a rapid onset that has a durable effect. Now, I understand you probably are not synaptic biologists, but to, it, to those, those folks that they have some background in uh, basic neuroscience, this is, this is the, the basic finding upon which four decades of work has been uh, based, and that's LTP and LTD. These are the canonical changes that we think can explain changes in behavior. And this is, these are changes in, the, in synaptic strength within well-defined neural circuits. So what you see here, this is a classic paper from Eric Kandel, which led to Nobel Prize and Masao Ito in the 80s. Two different organisms. This is a, a sea snail on the left and a, a rat on the right. And what you see here is the size of, your, of a, a synaptic potential, a brief intervention, which is a titanic burst of activity, followed by this sustained change in the size of that potential. And that relates to a behavior in the sea snail. Likewise, you see something similar happening in, in rat, and this is in the cerebellum. So the point is that the, these, two, um, th these two phenomena of long-term uh, potentiation and depression are what we associate with changes in behavior. Now the trick is how do you actually figure out where those changes are happening and once we understand that then maybe we can begin to build upon uh, the therapies that we've, we've been studying. So there is a question uh, that I often get here as well. You know, a lot of people take MDMA and ketamine, but we don't really see, <laughs> not everybody seems to get a, a benefit. And, you know, it, they take it in all kinds of contexts. And this is a basic epidemiology question, is you have, for example, in the operating room, there are probably 100 million anesthetics every year. Ketamine has been used for many, many years. Uh, and yet anesthesiologists seem to have missed this effect. So how did that happen? Uh, and with MDMA, you have, uh, at least according to the CDC estimates, a million new recreational users each year. So, and this really leads to two questions is, for example, you know, what were we just not looking at all at our patients? Uh, and in the case of MDMA is where are all the cases of people that go to raves and have spontaneously remitting psychiatric diseases? And the point is that these, uh, the, it's, it's not that we haven't looked, these things just don't seem to happen. And that's because these uh, therapies require a context. And this is something we know uh, in the realm of synaptic uh, plasticity, and this is becoming increasingly evident at the level of therapy. And again, so this is, uh, this is actually a, a screen cap of Dr. Midhofer uh, from the, I think, the MAPS website. Um, but you can see that the basic um, equation that I'm, uh, or in parallel that I'm trying to draw is that MDMA in the context of ongoing therapy can yield these incredible long-lasting results. And when we think about how we can translate this to other types of therapy, for example, uh, deep brain stimulation, which I'll talk about a little bit, it's the same kind of idea. And this echoes, again, the basic work on long-term potentiation and depression, that cellular drug action plus neural activity of some kind, be it therapy, be it direct stimulation of neurons, can have an effect at the level of behavior and at the level of circuits. So our job is to figure out, well, what is that actual transformation? Okay, let me introduce you now to Dr. Franz Wollenweider. He is a professor at the University of Zurich, where he leads a major research group which is funded uh, in part by the state of Switzerland. Um, 
and it has been going on this research for a number of years before the FDA woke up to the reality of the psychedelics having some utility in psychiatry. So his uh, group is way ahead and has laid a lot of groundwork for what we are now trying to catch up to. Now what struck me about his presentation, and it's quite a long presentation, I include his uh, slide set um, in the um, presentation page. You can click on it and see the other slides that he has presented. We will not go into details uh, because we need to unravel some of these details in a more comprehensive way in a later major lecture. So what he set out to do is look at uh, Zen meditators. These are uh, Zen students uh, that go to the mountain uh, in Lucerne, uh, uh, the pilot uh, Pilatus Mountain, a beautiful mountain overlooking Lucerne, and go on retreats. So uh, Dr. Wollenweider took his whole equipment up on the mountain for a number of these retreats and studied these um, Zen adepts in a number of different ways, namely by extensive rating scales to assess the depth of their absorption in the meditative state, uh, their general um, wellness and happiness and many other uh, parameters of the experience of both meditation and the state induced by psychedelic drugs. Now, he did it in a double-blind way where some of the Zen meditators got uh, psilocybin and the others got a placebo. And then these uh, people were scanned with a variety of instruments including MRI, EEGs and many others. The data is not been published yet and I'm looking forward uh, to their appearance in the literature. Now, what you will see in his results is a very striking observation that among these meditators that have years of experience and Zen training, those who received this, the, a single dose of psilocybin had a dramatic increase in a number of uh, parameters such as the oceanic feeling that comes along with a psychedelic experience and many other uh, parameters that um, a Zen meditation alone was not able to produce. In addition, he looked at the correlational analysis of which of these different rating scales would predict uh, lasting changes in well-being and other health parameters in these folks a number of months down the road. And there were very specific and a restricted set of experiences induced by psychedelic drugs that predicted statistically who would have significant health benefits and psychological benefits from this experience. Outcome longer effects we studied the impact of a certain uh, cognitive control that is trained in mindfulness training. The core of mindfulness training is certainly emotional flexibility, attention, uh, the people uh, exercise over years, this, for instance, and cognitive flexibility is what people do, then the non-judgmental awareness, and then they have another behavior, physical well-being, mental well-being, depending on their capacity of the core processes. So to study the impact of uh, cognition and emotional regulation in detail. We did four retreats with uh, Zen Buddhist uh, experts that had more than uh, about 6,000 hours of meditation at least, 20 years, almost all the same, the same school of Zen. And it was possible to do that with the help of uh, my friend, Vanya Palmas, who himself is a Zen master and runs uh, center in the Swiss mountains. So we packed the whole lab, went up. Uh, it was not easy, but here you see the wonderful um, Pilatus and like of Lucerne. We were up here completely alone for seven days. Um, 
these Zen Buddhists have trained in a retreat. They were not allowed to speak. They did all their mantras in different forms according to the teacher. They uh, have known that kind of praxis. And you see a little bit in that wonderful sandal made of completely of wood and ab absolutely silent. And here we measured every evening the meditation depth with rating scales. We were interested in the state they uh, acquire over the daily so eight hours of meditation, and therefore half of them got double by controlled placebo, the other one got uh, psilocybin, and we had always in a retreat five psilocybin plus uh, five placebo, ten. Tremendous uh, feeling of connected, being connected, we call that uh, unity in our scales. Uh, spiritual experience was up to 70, some 80, this is standard error, 90%. Uh, blissful state, also some imaging here. Don't want to go into details, but the question was, what are the predictors? We did a number of psychological ratings before, like absorption, depth, they have lifetime mystical experience with uh, rating scales, cognitive uh, control, how they control their thinking, emotional control, can they really accept their emotion, or are they just cognitively controlled? That's a very important difference, and uh, meditation depth, as I said, and the meditation status. And what we found that this oceanic, uh, let's say, selflessness or boundlessness was mostly driven by psilocybin, by meditation depths over the three years, which increased a lifelong uh, mysticism experience. Visionary uh, experiences like this here this, uh, were mostly dependent on psilocybin, meditation depths, and absorption. How good they can absorb is a specific task for that. And then the other side was anxious ego dissolution, loss of ego boundaries, not oceanically and uh, positive, but with anxiety, uh, depended mostly on the dose of psilocybin, together with other data we have, and how good they can accept their, uh, their emotion as a part of themselves. So here emotion comes in also in terms of how you can get open up and get rid of your boundaries. And uh, this was a first uh, detailed uh, insight, and what you see here, the other half of the group, these are 20 and 20 subjects, they didn't go deeply into uh, an altered state in terms of oceanic boundlessness. It's quite, quite nothing, 20% about. We were really asking, what's going on here? They trained for years and stay there. And here you see the lifetime mystical experience, here the placebo group in, in the retreat, and here is psilocybin. Psilocybin really propels people into that state, so it's, it was the most, uh, in terms of variance uh, explanation, uh, most important factor beside emotion, emotional acceptance. But here we did another thing, I analyzed here, uh, age and sex matched controls that had the same dose like uh, the psilocybin people in the retreat. But they come only up in these measures, for instance, blissfulness up to 50, 60 percent. There's something in with the long year training. We just do a control uh, uh, experiments with uh, beginners. So in summary then, I give you a brief glimpse at uh, two of the papers uh, that appeared in the MAPS meeting. There were many, many more very uh, exciting papers it's a very interesting group of people that seem very tolerant to different backgrounds and attitudes. You can hear anything from uh, anthropologists, psychologists, um, um, people who study shamanism uh, in the jungle and uh, people who look for mushrooms in the San Francisco Bay Area and they all get along just uh, tremendously. Uh, so there is not this rigidity and the uh, barriers that exist in formalized science. This is a new group that is uh, trying to find his way. A very interesting study in progress that I have not reported on is the so-called microdosing of LSD. 
In the Bay Area, there are a number of uh, enterprising people that are at the cutting edge of both computer science, uh, technology, and self-exploration. And about 400 is the latest estimate of these people have undergone microdosing. That means they take uh, a dose of LSD much too low for a real psychedelic experience, but nevertheless able to perhaps reset and trigger a number of their 5-HT2A receptors in the cortex and thereby perhaps uh, causing a slow burn reset of some of the circuitry in the brain. And anecdotal reports say that many people report increased vitality, decreased depression, increased creativity and other psychological and health benefits. Now the jury on this is out because the study was done uh, in a haphazard kind of wild west way. It's not been standardized but now uh, rating scales are being introduced by Dr. Faderman who is running the study and perhaps slowly this very important new research area will be put on a more scientific footing as well. Now if you go to the presentation page or if you click uh, in the brackets to this presentation uh, at the PDF files you will find a large number of PDF files that I have not reported on here but they will form the foundation of other lectures yet to come because this area is in an explosive growth and really highlights the potential of going from what we know about a drug acting at, on a receptor, uh, thereby changing brain circuitry and uh, plasticity and changing deep psychological changes uh, in our brain as well as in our lives. So thank you very much for your attention and I'll be reporting shortly to you from the American Psychiatric Association in San Diego. We will be down there at this meeting, Behavioral Health 2000, and uh, do some filming and we'll report to you on the most exciting findings that are presented at the APA in San Diego in uh, late in May. Thanks for your attention. See you soon at Behavioral Health 2000.